Okay, I think we can start. Good evening, good day, good morning. It is my pleasure to start our second seminar. And today we have a pleasure to listen a talk by Nette Engelhardt. She will tell us about simplicity of black hole interior. Please. One hour, uh, maybe a little more. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Irina, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, really, really nice idea um, to have this rotating seminar. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the simplicity in the black hole interior. And this work is, this, this talk is based primarily on a recent paper with Jeff Pennington and Arvind Shabazi Magadan, but also, um, inspired heavily by work with Aaron Wall um, in 2017 and, uh, and 2018. So let me begin with a little bit of, a, of an overview, um, maybe 60,000 foot perspective. So the past couple of years have been uh, a real renaissance on the black hole information frontier. Here's a, I'm drawing the sort of canonical image of the uh, evaporating black hole and the Hawking quanta in going in uh, the interior and out, uh, exterior modes. Uh, and so we, we've really been able to make a lot of progress uh, in this past couple of years, which has been tremendously exciting. And one of the things that has been so exciting is that insights from these new developments in the black hole information paradox have started to teach us more about gravity in general and have us questioning uh, things like the gravitational path integral and talking about ensemble averaging. And uh, all of that has been very exciting Partly because, of course, this is why we're interested in the black hole information paradox in the first place, this is why I'm interested in the black hole information paradox, uh, which is the, to learn more about quantum gravity. Now, we can certainly get a lot of mileage out of the, uh, the developments that we have so far, computing the page curve and so on. But uh, fact remains that despite very rapid progress, we haven't yet resolved the paradox. And as a spoiler, I will not be resolving the paradox in this talk either. Uh, but this is something that we, that's important to keep in mind um, that we want to work towards to actually resolve the black hole information paradox. So I wanna just in sort of have a very lightning review of where we stand now as far as the developments. And by way of that also introduce some of the ingredients that are going to be very important in the duration of this talk. So two years ago, uh, we computed the unitary page curve from the so-called quantum extremal surface formula. And since this formula is really uh, extremely important for this talk, let me just belabor the point and spend a couple of minutes on it. So the quantum extremal surface formula is a holographic way of computing for Neumann entropies in ADS-CFT. We pick some boundary region R, or it can also be the entire asymptotic boundary. And we compute the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix on R using this, uh, this formula here, which takes the area of a surface chi R over four in Planck units, plus the von Neumann entropy on one side of chi R, where that is the side that is between chi R and R. This is of course called the generalized entropy of the surface chi R. And this is a, not just any surface. We can, this is not going to be true for an arbitrary surface that we pick. We need, to, in particular, use a quantum extremal surface, which is to say it's a surface that extremizes the generalized entropy. In other words, if you slightly vary the location of the surface, perturb it a bit, then um, the generalized entropy of that surface won't change to leading order in the perturbation. And it's possible for there to be multiple candidate quantum extremal surfaces in which case we pick the minimal one, the one with the smallest value of the generalized entropy. And that'll actually be uh, important. The, the existence of multiple quantum extremal surfaces is pretty important for this talk. So in, in simple setups, the, there was an application of this uh, formula, this quantum extremal surface formula for the Hawking radiation in the setup where you have an ADS black hole evaporating into a reservoir has been derived from the uh, gravitational path integral, the Euclidean gravitational path integral by the so-called East Coast and West Coast groups. So uh, Pennington et al for the West Coast group and um, Hyrie et al for the, uh, the East Coast groups. So this was, uh, this is, based, this, this is many, some of the developments in, uh, in 2019. Now, 
I want to go back to the question of resolving the paradox, which involves talking about Hawking's calculation and not just about the quantum extremal surface calculation. So Hawking's calculation that gives us a non-unitary answer can be done without any input from quantum gravity. It's a purely it's a semi-classical calculation, effective field theory. Now, the quantum extremal surface calculation in principle only involves quantities that are semi-classical. You can execute it only using semi-classical gravity, surfaces, entropies, etc. cetera. Um, but interpreting it as a calculation of a von Neumann entropy, that requires input from quantum gravity in the guise of the particular interpretation of the gravitational path integral or in terms of just assuming holography. Now, in particular, one of the important aspects of this is that if we want to reconstruct the interior of the black hole from the Hawking radiation, this does require some sort of input from quantum gravity. And in my opinion, what we need to do to resolve the information paradox is to understand what additional input Hawking's calculation, which is this fully semi-classical calculation, would need in order to give the same result that we obtain from the quantum extremal surface calculation, which is only operationally classic, semi-classical. In other words, it needs some quantum gravity input. So what is the input? That is the, that is the question, one of the questions that we need to answer in order to resolve the information paradox. So one way of starting to ask to approach this is to ask what's missing from Hawking's calculation. So we have two ways of computing the entropy of Hawking radiation. We can use the quantum extremal surface formula, or if you prefer, the gravitational path integral, or we can use a Hawking's calculation, the globe of transformations, et cetera. And of course, they give different answers. So we want to know where do these two approaches diverge? If we were to put these two approaches on the same platform, how would they differ from one another? That's sort of step one towards understanding how to, where, in some sense, where Hawking went wrong, what was missing from his calculation. So if you ask me before 2019, what's missing in sort of a very vague intuitive sense from Hawking's result, I would say, oh, you know, Harlow Hayden probably means that somewhere, somehow, Hawking's calculation lost track of any exponentially complex data. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, the, the logic here is following from the uh, nice for demonstration by Hawk, Harlow and Hayden and followed by Scott Aronson, Kim Tang and Preskill, who showed that if you want to decode the Hawking radiation, if you, if, you, if you can do it, say after the page time, this is exponentially hard. So Hawking not being able to see the Hawking, the interior, not being able to see that the radiation uh, evolves unitarily, suggests that potentially he was in some sense coarse graining over um, exponential complexity. So the idea here is that the Hawking radiation after the page time, well, it walks like a thermal state and it quacks like a thermal state, but it's actually not a thermal state. If it were a thermal state, then it would have no information about the infalling matter. But if you want to see that it's not a thermal state, that it actually contains correlations and information about the infalling matter, that is exponentially hard. And so it's, you could say it's easy or simple to mistake the Hawking radiation for thermal. And so Hawking's radiation could potentially be coarse graining over high complexity. Now, post-2019, nowadays, if you ask most people where Hawking, what Hawking did wrong, people would probably say, or at least have said to me, isn't it obvious? He used the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral. And what they mean by that is this replica trick calculation, the gravitational replica trick calculation, a la Lefkowitz Maldosena, that justifies the use of the quantum extremal surface formula for the radiation. And the idea is that there is a, that you have two different saddles, that one of them, so this one, the disconnected one, when you introduce this replica trick, you introduce replica, um, multiple copies of the boundary, and one of the saddles is disconnected, and you have a saddle which actually is connected. And the, the wrong saddle corresponds to a subdominant, non-minimal quantum extremal surface that comes from this disconnected topology. Whereas the quantum extremal surface that corresponds to the correct one, the minimal one that gives you the page curve, that one corresponds to the connected topology. So some of the uh, prevailing opinions uh, is, are that Hawking somehow used the wrong quantum extremal surface, the subdominant saddle. Excuse me, Nada, are the two viewpoints you described actually in conflict? Absolutely not. And I'll say that and uh, I'll talk about that momentarily. Yeah, they're completely, con uh, they're completely um, complementary to one another. Now, I, I do, I do want to say that it's, uh, 
this is sort of intuitive and conceptual, but it's not clear when where in Hawking's calculation, he just indiscriminately started to impose ignorance of high complexity data. And it's also not, not clear, you know, where he started using the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral, given that he didn't use the gravitational path integral. Um, but we're try sort of trying to just bridge the gap here. So any intuition goes a long way. So the question, of course, um, as Edward already pointed out, we want to understand that whether these two perspectives are compatible. It's important that they be compatible because it's not clear that one of them should be wrong. And in fact, by understanding the way in which these two mistakes are really one and the same, we can make progress towards a, potentially make progress towards a resolution of the paradox. So we want, I want to ask the question, what does it mean in terms of the Lorentzian bulk geometry to implement ignorance of high complexity and to use the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral, where the second one we kind of understand already in the sense that it means using the subdominant, the non-minimal quantum extremal surface. So can these two be packaged into one unified statement? And this was at least in part provided by the so-called Python's lunch proposal by uh, Brown, Garibian, Pennington, and Susskind. They were motivated by tensor networks and they proposed that whenever there exists a non-minimal quantum extremal surface in the entanglement wedge, so here we have the minimal quantum extremal surface, the entanglement wedge is everything to its right. And here is a, another quantum extremal surface, which is non-minimal, which lives in the entanglement wedge. So whenever there exists a non-minimal quantum extremal surface in the entanglement wedge, then reconstruction of the region behind the non-minimal quantum extremal surface is exponentially complex. Why is this called the Python's lunch? Um, it's called the Python's lunch because of the shape of a Cauchy slice here. So the, here we have this C, which is the causal surface, the bifurcation surface of these two horizons. We have X, which is a locally minimal, but not globally minimal quantum extremal surface. And we have X min, which is the uh, globally minimal, the dominant quantum extremal surface. And so between these two, there's a bulge here with another uh, quantum extremal surface, which is in fact, not a local minimum, but a local maximum. And the proposal is that everything that sits in this lunch region, which kind of looks like a Python's lunch, this, this thing here, anything that sits inside this Python's lunch is exponentially hard to reconstruct. And this, this, the complexity, this, uh, this so-called restricted complexity is given by this, this uh, it's proportional to this exponential here, which is uh, given by the difference of the generalized entropy of this, this bulge surface, which I haven't drawn, and the generalized entropy of this non-minimal uh, quantum extremal surface. So this gives, uh, this gives a nice link between, the, um, between complexity and the non-minimal quantum extremal surface. But it also uh, sort of has a, a, miss, a gap region, which is a little bit curious. So we can we expect that anything in the causal wedge can be reconstructed in a in, in a simple way simply by um, it, well we can we can just evolve it backwards in this sort of non-standard Cauchy evolution from this point to the boundary and then there are some boundary sources here that correspond to whatever we turned on at this point. So we expect everything in the causal wedge to be simple. And by the Python's lunch proposal, we expect everything in the um, in the lunch say this here. To be, um, to be exponentially complex. But um, that kind of leaves this region between X and C uh, not addressed in this proposal. What is, uh, what is this gap region between the non-minimal quantum extremal surface and the causal surface? So what we wanna ask, what is, what is going on over here? And the reason that we care about that is that in order to have a definitive and clear connection between core screening over complexity and the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, we actually need a little bit more than the Python's lunch conjecture. We need to know that it's possible to reconstruct simply everything up to this, this non-minimal quantum extremal surface that we call the, the appetizer to the lunch. And, uh, and the reason for that is if we want everything behind the quantum extremal surface, to be, we want everything behind the quantum extremal surface to be highly complex. And, but we want the quantum extremal surface to be the boundary between what's highly complex and what isn't. And so that means we actually need something stronger than the Python's lunch. And in, that will mean that part of the black hole interior does need to be simple to reconstruct. So this is, uh, this is a little bit related to work that uh, Aaron and I did back in 2017 and 2018 about reconstruction uh, somewhat, sometimes behind the event horizon where we essentially propose that whatever reconstruction procedure you can use to obtain the data up to 
and on the event horizon can be used to reconstruct all the way up to the outermost outward stationary surface, by which I mean a surface which is stationary in the, um, in the outgoing direction. And I'll say a lot more about that uh, shortly. But if it's true, then this suggests the converse of the Python's launch proposal. Because this surface here is uh, the outermost quantum extremal surface, meaning it's the outermost quantum stationary surface. So this would suggest that we can actually use the same procedure that we use to reconstruct the causal wedge, which is simple, to get to reconstruct all the way up to this outermost extremal wedge. And that would suggest a converse of the Python's lunch, which is, uh, which is what Jeff and Arvin and I uh, did in this recent paper. So we gave a physics level of rigor, so not mathematical level of rigor, physics level of rigor uh, proof, or if you prefer, since it's physics level of rigor argument of this in the strictly classical regime, which gives strong evidence in favor of this strong Python's lunch that non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces are in fact the only source of exponential complexity. And when I say non-minimal ones, I mean in particular um, the outermost one. And there's also, we also have uh, current work in progress that includes quantum corrections, which is, it's a quite, quite a different situation because as we all know now, once you include quantum corrections, the quantum extremal surface can behave quite differently from a classical extremal surface. And in fact, you can have non-trivial quantum extremal surfaces, even in space times that have uh, no non-trivial classical extremal surfaces. So the story is quite different in the case where we include quantum corrections. Uh, and I, I was thinking, how do I fit both of these into one talk? And then I, uh, I found out that Jeff is actually giving a talk in a month at the same seminar series. So I decided that Jeff is going to talk about the, uh, this current work in progress. And, uh, and I will talk about what we have done so far. So for those of you who have questions on the quantum uh, case, I'll say a few words at the, at the end, and then there'll be a, a more uh, in-depth talk in a month. Okay, so here's the general structure of the talk. I'm going to describe briefly the general idea behind um, this way of using, what you, using a, the reconstruction in the causal wedge to push all the way up to the outermost extremal surface. This will be the rough idea rather than the specifics. And then I'm going to illustrate how it works in the very simple toy model of uh, JT gravity in a massless scalar, minimally coupled massless scalar. This is going to be, again, purely classical. I'm not working with uh, with quantum matter here. And then there's, there's more complications that come up with higher dimensions, but I sort of sketch out how it works without going into too many of the, of the gory details of the uh, null constraint equation. And there's one, uh, kind of interesting application that I'll mention. And then in the last bit, I'll say a few words about the quantum corrections and uh, what you can look forward to in Jeff's talk in, uh, in a few weeks. So before I can talk about the general idea, I need to introduce a little bit of terminology. So whenever I say a surface, I'm always going to talk about a surface that's homologous to the asymptotic boundary. And whenever I, and I also would mean a space-like co-dimension two surface, which in particular means that I have these uh, future directed uh, outgoing null vectors fired from it. There are two of them. And I'm going to call one K and one L. And we, we call the surface marginally trapped if it has vanishing expansion in one direction and negative expansion in the other. Where expansion here, theta K, is proportional to the, uh, to the area, the change in area along that particular direction. And we'll call it marginally anti-trapped if it has positive expansion in one direction and zero expansion in the other direction. It's extremal if it has vanishing expansion in, uh, in both directions, which of course is the statement that the area doesn't change to leading order in, the per in any perturbations. And outermost extremal if it lies in the so-called extremal wedge, the analog of the entanglement wedge for of any other uh, extremal surface. Now, it may, not, it may not be obvious to you that the outermost extremal surface necessarily exists. I'm not going to prove it to you, but you can prove that, uh, that it does. So, you know, you don't have to worry about a situation where there's sort of all, all extremal surfaces are kind of over, always overlapping uh, on one another. Okay, so what's the basic idea? So the, the first essential ingredient is that we, is that reconstruction up to the event horizon is simple. It's easy. It's just causal Lorentzian evolution of the equations of motion from the data on the boundary. Um, so this, this is not a standard Cauchy evolution. We, in a discussion, we can fight about how valid that is, but this is the, the essential ingredient that we're going to use here. Now, what's the intuition? The intuition is that the outermost extremal surface is essentially what a stationary bifurcation surface looks like locally. 
So when we have a stationary bifurcation surface, like in Schwarzschild, the, uh, the horizon bifurcate on the extremal surface. So the ext an extremal surface essentially just looks like a stationary bifurcation surface. And further intuition is the idea that event horizons should only fail to be stationary because of some infalling matter or gravitational waves. So that's, that's intuition. And so putting these two together, we say, well, the only reason that the outermost extremal surface should fail to lie on the event horizon, so that we actually, the only situation where we actually have a gap between C and X is where we have some perturbation on the event horizon, some infalling matter or gravitational waves. And so what we'd like to do is to show that it's possible to remove this infalling matter by turning off or turning on simple boundary sources. So the idea here is we say, okay, well, we can reconstruct up to the event horizon. We can figure out what is this infalling matter across the event horizon, what sources it corresponds to in the dual theory. And that is going to be all, it's all going to be causal. That's all just something like HKLL. So it's simple. So we can turn those off and then we do HKLL again and we get a stationary event horizon instead. So this would push this procedure, would push the event horizon towards stationarity without ever having to use anything more than, uh, than HKLL and sources of operators that propagate causally into the bulk. So this keeps us in this sort of simple uh, regime. So here's a, just an illustrative uh, example. So we have, this is by idea collapse with an ingoing thin shell. And we can think of this as uh, something like a quantum quench. So here, up, up here we have some, so a, a surface on the event horizon is marginally trapped. This is stationary in this direction. The outermost extremal surface in the space time is the empty set. And what we, what we can do is we can say, all right, let's, uh, let's reconstruct everything in the causal wedge. And we can then say, all right, well, we can reconstruct everything in the causal wedge. We see that we turned on some operator here and we just turn off that operator that removes the ingoing thin shell. And as a consequence, we are able to get a space time where the entire space time is in the causal wedge. The, we can reconstruct simply up to the, the outermost extremal surface, which in this case is just the empty set. So this is, of course, just one example where it's particularly simple, no pun intended, um, but that is the, uh, that, that's just an illustration of this, uh, this idea. Okay, so here, that, that's, again, this is a sort of the, the collapse, the one-sided uh, black hole. We're also interested in what happens um, in this case over here, perhaps more interested in uh, where we have this uh, non-trivial outermost uh, extremal surface. And so in mean, this non-trivial so-called appetizer surface, we want to bring this surface C to X. We want to push the event horizons all the way up to X so that we have these stationary event horizons. So put differently, we want to show that this region between X and C can be simply reconstructed. We can just push through with various applications of just HKLL. Oh, sorry. And if, if we can show this, then that would tell us that uh, simple reconstruction, reconstruction of the causal wedge, the same procedure we use for the causal wedge, gets us all the way up to the outermost extremal surface. And so it's only, it's only stuff that's behind the outermost extremal surface that can be exponentially complex. So this is the basic idea. We're going to take to heart the proposal that the only thing for the, the only reason that the event horizon would fail to be stationary is if something is falling across the event horizon. Gravitational wave, matter, anything. We're going to, well, re remove this matter by prescribing new initial data on the event horizon. So what's, what's going on here? The idea is, all right, we have something that's falling across the event horizon and we want to get rid of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to prescribe new initial data on the event horizon that gets rid of it. But then we have to figure out how to map this new initial data back to the asymptotic boundary. So we then use HKLL to evolve this back to the asymptotic boundary. This tells us that we can turn, you can use simple operators to just turn off this matter that's falling across the horizon. Then we use HKLL again to evolve from the asymptotic boundary back in which gets us further in now because the process of turning off matter that's falling across the horizon pushes the event horizon further in. So then we get, we, we, get, we push the, the horizon further in. 
we get eventually we get a stationary future horizon. So that gives us one direction. We have a, now we have a stationary future horizon. Of course, what we actually want is a stationary bifurcation surface. Well, no problem. We just do this, repeat this procedure, and, and you know when we're evolving backwards. So we just do the time reverse. Once again, we figure out how to remove the sources in the gravity picture. We evolve that backwards towards the asymptotic boundary. We figure out which sources we need to turn off, evolve it back towards the bulk. That gets us deeper in until we get to a stationary past horizon. And we, we keep on doing this until we limit to the outermost extremal surface. This procedure can't get us further than the outermost extremal surface by cosmic censorship. So this simple procedure, is consistent with the uh, the original Python's lunch proposal in the sense that we it will not get us any further than the outermost extremal surface. Uh, Nana, if I could ask a question here. Yeah, sure. I guess part of your argument here has to depend on this idea that six doing it over and over again is not exponentially complex. Um, but you might think that evolving forwards and backwards in time by unitary evolution over and over again with different sources might still get kind of complex. So is there an argument that is it exponentially complex? Well, so in the classical case, it's kind of, you say exponential in what, right? You don't really have a, a, a parameter that you could be exponential in since we're setting the G, GH bar is actually zero, but that's a bit of a cop-out answer. Um, so the the idea here, yes, we want, we were saying everything is, um, it's, it, so it's more complex than just working straight up with the causal wedge. Um, you are doing time folds, but all of these operators that we're turning on are causal on some time fold, which it's still going to be simpler than operators that are not going to be causal on any time fold. So that is the, the 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 longer answer, but you do have to sort of specify what you mean by uh, exponentially complex, exponentially many of these iterations, uh, exponentially in what? Um, I think I like your cop out answer. I, I prefer, like okay, all right, then we can stick with the cop out answer then. <laughs> um, Actually, there was some other question in the chat. Uh, Alexei, Professor Stravinsky, do you want to ask this? Uh, Sorry, you want to just to read the, the question or? Um... No, I'm, I'm asking uh, Alexis Trebinsky, do you want to ask the question which you uh, put in the chat? Okay, not uh, just, um, um, I would say that I'm from a little bit different community. So um, you begin just your talk with mentioning page curve and page 10. And what I cannot find in all papers, what is the exact the definition of, a oh, of the of, of the page. So go ahead. What we know in our community, our community is uh, no well uh, say a uh, black hole that have evaporation time. So, so my question is, what is the what is the principle? So so. In, in principle, we were talking about when the black hole has evaporated more than half its mass. Um, you can, if you prefer to think of it in more uh, information theoretic terms, you could say it's the point at which we, after which we expect to be able to start reconstructing the uh, the, the radiation. Yeah, that, that's an ideologically loaded answer. No, no, I, would, I would say it has a definition regardless of your ideology, which is that it's the point when exactly half of the entropy has radiated. And I'm pretty sure this is different from exactly half the energy or exactly half the time. So this, this is true. That's, that's true. To have no, its own day. It's this. You really need to slightly well, modify what Aaron just said. Of course, the it, has some, it has some sub-coefficient, but, but once more, um, <laughs> well, uh, for, for, uh, for a black hole evaporation or half a evaporation, or, and you say in decrease of E times, we have a well-known expression. So once more, what, is the, what was the aim of introducing another name for this, well, for this um, quantity? Uh, you mean historically? Um, I, I would say that, uh, that Page is the one who realized the significance of this, so uh, he certainly deserved to get credit for that, if that's the question. No, one, once more, 
uh, as I said, I don't feel well. Uh, well, uh, of course, if uh, if if black hole lose on half of its mass just because it is it is a it is a quantum and stochastic stochastic process. You in some sense you cannot. Define the, so, so perhaps I can the, defer the, the rest of the question to after the talk since the page yes, time is not super yes. relevant for uh, for the rest of the talk. So I want to I want to well, get through for, the for yeah. our for me I would say that uh, uh, maybe indeed because I'm at less worried, at worried about entropy I'm more at worried about intensity of already radiation from the coals. Yes. Okay. Continue, please. Okay. Um, may I ask a question? Uh, just to make sure I understand uh, the reason why your prescription does not contradict the uh, Presky Hayden protocol is that they want to reconstruct the information from the emitted radiation, whereas you just reconstruct it from the uh, different uh, from the evolution of the horizon, right? Uh, yeah, so first of all, this is purely classical. So we're not, there's, there's no, so things look different uh, once you add quantum corrections. You, this is purely classical. So there's no, uh, you know, there's no, there's no radiation in the system just yet. I will, I, I'm going to comment a bit on the, on what happens when we add quantum corrections later on and it, th things do change. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me um, move on to the uh, the toy model of JT plus a massless scalar. So we're going to take JT with a minimally coupled massless scalar. Uh, in Dilaton gravity, surfaces are points, so you might wonder what does area mean? There's no area. Instead, we use the um, we just use the di the Dilaton value. So the expansion is now given as a derivative of the Dilaton. So point is extremal if the derivative of the Dilaton in both null directions is zero. So we're going to so in JT plus a scalar, um, the horizon is not going to be generically stationary. So uh, the bifurcation surface will also not be stationary, which means it is not going to be extremal. And in the particular case of a minimally coupled massless scalar, this is only this can only be a result of the of, sorry of JT plus a minimally coupled massless scalar. This can only be the result of focusing from the scalar. There's no you know gravitons to worry about or shear or anything like that. It's just going to be the scalar. And this is a massless scalar. We just have the uh, the right movers and the left movers. That's all we have to worry about here. So this is an illustration of what's going on here. We have stuff falling across the past horizon, stuff falling across the future horizon. And so we have focusing and we have non-stationarity of the bifurcation surface. So the the in this in this particular toy model, we don't have to, we don't have to do the thing where we explicitly uh, change the, the, the modes on the event horizon, evolve back, figure out what we have to do over here and then evolve forwards. In this model, things are simple enough that we already know what we need to do on the asymptotic boundary. So what do we need to do? Well, to begin with, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the left movers. For example, by putting absorbing boundary conditions for the right movers, we can, we can turn these off. And so what happens is this horizon no longer has anything falling across it. So this horizon is stationary. And you'll notice we now have a new bifurcation surface as a result of that, because by removing stuff falling from across the horizon, you push the horizon further in. And so now we have the surface uh, C2, which is the new bifurcation surface. And it's null separated to the old one because the event horizon had get, it's moved up. So, so here it is, it's a deeper bifurcation surface which is now stationary on this horizon, but it's marginally trapped, not extremal. And the reason for this is that we still have stuff falling across the past horizon. So this is still going to be negative. And of course, what we actually want is a surface which is extremal, which is to say is, is stationary in both directions. So what do we do now? Well, we're going to evolve backwards and this time we're going to remove the, the right movers. So we're going to remove this one, these ones this time. And this works in exactly the same way. It's going to push the past horizon deeper in and make it stationary. So we were at C2, we now get pushed further in to C3. 
C3 is going to have vanishing expansion is going to be stationary in this direction. But as a consequence of pushing this horizon deeper in, we've revealed new modes. And so now we have focusing again on this part of the horizon. So this surface was marginally trapped, but this one is going to be, this one's going to be marginally anti-trapped because we have this source of focusing over here. So altogether, we start out with this. this. This is going to, this has focusing both here and here. We evolved, we, we removed some focusing. So this only had focusing in this direction. Then we removed the focusing in this direction, but we also incurred focusing in the other direction as a consequence of revealing these new modes. So we can imagine kind of iterating this procedure and, uh, and we ask, okay, what, um, where does this end up? Well, it's bounded by the outermost extremal surface, again, by cosmic censorship, but does it actually reach the outermost extremal surface? And we can sort of give a, a quick argument for why it, it should actually uh, limit to the outermost extremal surface. So let's suppose that we are, um, we're, we're sort of close to the limiting surface, whatever it is. So here's, here's our future horizon, our past horizon. And we suppose that, so this is, so CA is some, one of these zigzag surfaces which is going to be stationary in this direction and not stationary in this direction. It's very close to C limb. So this is a monotonic procedure. So if we get close to C limb, then this is a very small neighborhood. And CB is the surface that we're going to get in the next iteration by removing focusing from the past horizon and which will incur focusing on the future horizon. And this, this, so we're going to introduce a set of new coordinates, V and U. So um, V here is delta V, V is an affine parameter along this null congruence and delta V just measures uh, this distance here is a normalized um, affine parameter. So again, once we push this past, we're going to get that this surface is going to be uh, marginally anti-trapped. And again, we still have the focusing situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to work in this infinitesimal small neighborhood where we can uh, approximate it as the approximate metric is just Minkowski space minus d, 2 du dd, where v is the affine parameter in this direction and u is an affine parameter in the l direction and going this way. Now in these coordinates, we can easily give a lower bound to delta v in terms of the, the, the u derivative of phi evaluated here and the, um, the maximum value of the cross-focusing of the u, uh, the u dv of phi, the maximum value on this interval delta v. So this is a, a lower bound on delta V and we can give a similar one on delta U. Now, as long as we assume that this is bounded from below, then delta V and delta U are gonna go to zero, no slower than the expansion of the surface approach zero. So that means that we're not going to stop iterating until we get to zero. And so this tells us that the limiting surface is in fact extremal after all. Okay, so that shows us that this, how this procedure, this procedure works in JT plus a massless, uh, massless minimally coupled scalar, which of course is an extremely, uh, it's a that's very simple situation, but it's, uh, it's a nice illustration. However, we do want to work with general matter in a general number of dimensions. So, um, so let's go to higher dimensions. And higher dimensions are harder for many reasons. And we're going to want to work more generally, not just uh, say we know what sources we have to turn off. We have to figure that out. We also have to deal with things like shear gravitational waves, but it turns out we can actually still do it. So here's the basic idea. We work perturbatively and we consider some deformation, call it Delta G to the event horizon. Now, again, the idea is we are going to take some deformation of the, uh, to the event horizon. This perturbation is going to reduce focusing on the event horizon. Then we're going to evolve it backwards using HKLL back to the asymptotic boundary. And then HKLL will tell us which sources we need to turn on in order to create this perturbation delta G. We turn on these sources, then we evolve further, then we evolve with HKLL again, and this time we go deeper in and we just repeat this procedure. Now, the thing that this perturbation absolutely has to do, it has to open up the light cones because we want it to push the event horizon deeper in. So that means that, for example, on the future horizon where K here is the generator, delta GKK has to be less than zero. Uh, equal to zero only if you're essentially it's already stationary in some directions. So 
we, we need a perturbation that satisfies this. And the trick is that you have to show that it's possible to find a perturbation like this that satisfies the null constraint equation on the event horizon. And furthermore, it doesn't result in a space time that violates the null energy condition somewhere. And you can show this, it, it's kind of ugly. I'm not going to go through all the detailed equations on how to do this, but it turns out that you can actually show that this works. So I'm going to just sketch out the idea. Again, I'm not gonna go through it actually showing that the constraint equations are satisfied. Uh, so let's just do this for the future horizon. Let's look at how this works. So we imagine we have some, I haven't drawn the past horizon here, not relevant for the moment. Here's our outermost extremal surface. Here's the event horizon. If the, if, if this outermost extremal surface doesn't lie on the event horizon, then, or at least if this, if the, this let's call this, if this, um, if the event horizon is not stationary, then it's because we have some source of focusing, which is going to be a result of some shear plus some um, null null stress tensor, TKK. And there can be a lot of it. We're not assuming that it's necessarily perturbatively close to equilibrium, that we are allowing any amount of shear or, or matter that we want. So what we have on the event horizon, we have some initial data that consists of the stress tensor, derivatives of G, the intrinsic geometry of the event horizon. And this is, we can think of this as being part of a characteristic initial data problem. This, uh, this event horizon, I mean the characteristic initial data problem, I just mean the evolution of the Einstein equation on a null hypersurface. Now, what we want to do, we want to perturb the initial data on the event horizon in a way that reduces the shear plus TKK. And that means prescribing a perturbation delta G that essentially dilutes the focusing. And we also need a matter source delta T for this perturbation uh, in most cases. And then what we have to do is we have to prove that this perturbed null initial data satisfies the constraint equation. Again, I'm not going to go through that. It's kind of a pain. Um, you can read the painful derivation in the paper. It does do this. Uh, the, the, sh the short and long answer is it ends up being a hyperbolic equation, which satisfies certain theorems that allow us to prove existence of certain solutions. And then what we do once we've done, once we've satisfied that, we say, okay, well, this is valid initial data. And we evolve this initial data backwards towards the asymptotic boundary using HKLL. This gives us simple sources and boundary language for preparing this perturbation. And then what we do is we, you, we, we evolve, we turn off the perturbation, we, we turn this perturbation on, we evolve further, we evolve in again. This, with this perturbation, the light cones have opened up on the event horizon and they push the event horizon further in, closer to the outermost extremal surface. And throughout this procedure, we didn't have to do anything a causal. All of this was just done with HKLL and causal matter that satisfies the null constraint equation. Now, so far, this is for a perturbation delta G, but um, of course, it's possible to have a lot of matter on the event horizon, and one small perturbation is not going to remove all of it. It'll remove some of it, but the, the reason that we want to work perturbatively, of course, is that it allows us to approximate the old event horizon as null in the new space time, so we have a well-defined characteristic initial data on it. But once we have figured out what sources correspond to delta G, we can just um, obtain the new space time we, we, we evolve with HKLL, we throw out the old space time. So now the new event horizon is the null hypersurface. And we introduce a new delta G that removes more focusing on the new event horizon. And we just iterate this procedure until we, uh, until we reach a stationary horizon. So under using properties of the null initial data problem, we can prove that the bifurcation surface either becomes trivial or asymptotes to a surface with vanishing expansion. Uh, and then what, we, what we're going to do to get the past event horizon to also match, we implement the same zigzag procedure that we did in two dimensions in JT gravity plus a massless scalar. So what this means is that this region between the event horizon and the outermost extremal surface, which again, it might be the empty set, but when it's not the empty set, it's going to be reconstructable using nothing but iterated evolution of boundary data via the equations of motion using HKLL. All of this is simple uh, and straightforward and causal. So that in some sense concludes the illustration of, um, of how this procedure works, that we can actually reconstruct using a, a, something like HKLL, iterated HKLL, all the way up to the outermost extremal surface. I want to say one word, maybe well, a little more than one word, but just a few, a few things. 
um, I think I have a little bit of time left on um, on this an application of this. So we we've obtained this state in which uh, we, in the paper we call it the exposed state in which the extremal surface, the outermost extremal surface is the bifurcation surface or the bifurcation surface asymptotes to it through this procedure. So maybe it gets arbitrarily close to it. And, uh, and that's great because it gives us an argument for the, uh, the Python's, the strong Python's lunch in the uh, classical regime. So we say, okay, that means that in the classical regime, extremal surfaces, um, everything up to the outermost extremal surface really is simple, which is, which is quite nice. But it does raise the question of um, what does this, this region, the wedge of the outermost extremal surface actually correspond to? Um, what does it actually mean? And, and, it, and this is important for us if we want to think when once we add quantum corrections, we want to think of Hawking's calculation as coarse graining over the region behind the outermost extremal surface because that's the sort of high complexity region. So here's a, what's, what's, uh, what's going on. So after executing our procedure to bring X and C together, we end up with the space time that looks like this. So we have some minimal extremal surface over here. We have the non-minimal extremal surface over here and it sits either right on or arbitrarily close to the bifurcation surface. And if what we can do uh, using a procedure that uh, Aaron and I proposed a while ago is actually create a, a new space time in which the outermost extremal surface is literally the HRT surface. So the way we do this is we say, okay, let's, let's fix everything outside of the outermost extremal surface. And we're going to then CPT conjugate the space time. We're going to throw out everything behind the surface. And so we're left with just this wedge. And then we're going to CPT conjugate in order to get the rest of the space time. That gives us a space time that looks like this, where X here is now the only extremal surface there is. Remember, it was the outermost extremal surface in this case. So its outer wedge doesn't have any extremal surfaces. So there's no extremal surface here. There's no extremal surface here. It's the only extremal surface in this space time. So therefore it's the HRT surface in the space time. And this, what this procedure does is it gives us, it means that in this space time, the entanglement wedge of this state dual to this is literally this region, the, ex, the outermost extremal wedge, the wedge of the outermost extremal surface. So if we think of, um, of throwing out the, uh, the stuff behind this extremal surface as being highly complex, then you know, we, we throw it out, we coarse grain over it, we obtain a space time where everything is simple. Uh, in the sense, you can reconstruct the entire entanglement wedge of the, of the, of the right side or the left side um, using nothing but HKLL. So this, this, in some sense, you want to call this like the simple state. Uh, this is the state that is, uh, sees everything that is identical to the state that's dual to this, as long as we're only looking at simple stuff and is different. Uh, and it does not contain any information about the stuff behind the extremal surface. So um, in some cases, this procedure is only going to get C to limit to X, but in certain cases, C and X will end up coinciding exactly. And so the CPT conjugated space time will be exactly stationary. So this space time in certain cases will be exactly stationary, not like, but not where the surface X is arbitrarily close to the horizon, but where it's actually stationary. And, um, and so in those cases, we have a theorem that, is, uh, that tells us what, how we can think of the dual state. So the, the theorem is that the causal and entanglement wedges coincide if and only if the dual boundary modular Hamiltonian generates a local geometric flow with respect to a boundary killing vector field. And so that tells us that the simple states, the ones where the extremal surface, but where the bifurcation surface really ends up being extremal. And again, once we've sort of forgotten about, um, about everything inside the lunch, that states like that are going to be, that, that these space times are going to be dual to states with a local modular flow. And so that in some sense, you can think of this as CFT dual to black hole uniqueness, which is that stationary black holes in ADS are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with states whose modular Hamiltonian generates an exactly local flow. Uh, and so this doesn't give us full control over what's going on with these, uh, these, these exposed states, because it certainly is possible to, and it, it will happen that the surface, the extremal surface 
uh, the bifurcation surface only asymptotes are get arbitrarily close to the extremal surface, in which case this theorem doesn't apply. But at least in those cases where they do end up coinciding, uh, this theorem tells us what kinds of states uh, we're looking at. So let me say a few words looking ahead. I'll talk briefly about quantum corrections. Um, again, Jeff is going to give a talk on it, a full talk on it as well, and I'm also a little bit out of time. Um, but let me say just a few words on that. Uh, I think Edward just raised a hand, so uh, let me maybe answer Edward's question first. Uh, Edward, do you want to ask your question? Question to you. No, I'll delay until the end of your talk. I'll, I'll go ahead and finish your talk, and then I'll ask. That sounds good. Um, okay, so this proves, I guess, proof uh, physics level of rigor, everything that we want um, in the classical regime. But of course, the whole point of this was to talk about what's going on in the case when we have quantum corrections and quantum extremal surfaces. And the classical argument is nice in that it gives us good uh, confidence that this is true, but the, the quantum corrections is really the, where, where the real business is. So, um, and in particular, we already know quantum extremal surfaces don't always behave the same way that classical extremal surfaces do. So uh, this, this means that things may really not work the same way. And we shouldn't just rely on the classical proof and say that, oh, small quantum corrections will only slightly jiggle the surface around. We know that there's not, this, things don't work this way. So there's also, in some sense, obvious examples where you don't see a quantum extremal surface, but you might expect that there's exponential complexity, which might lead you to think that this can't possibly be robust against quantum corrections. So what kind of I'm obvious in quotation marks uh, examples are there like this? Uh, well, if you consider say a, a non-evaporating black hole, which is say not coupled to a reservoir. So your sort of garden variety um, black hole, which is not, not evaporating, it's just, it's radiating, but it's not evaporating. Consider it late times after it settles down. So there's a general expectation that you shouldn't be able to easily decode the interior outgoing modes because of the transplant camp problem. So you say you might maybe you expect that there's some um, you know there's some, some exponential complexity that's involved in reconstructing the um, the interior Hawking modes in this type of situation. But at first glance, it really doesn't look like there's a quantum extremal surface in this space time. And part of this is that you could imagine this black hole form from collapse. And you have some, um, and, and you have reflecting boundary conditions, and so a quantum extremal surface, a non-trivial quantum extremal surface in this space time, would be very problematic because it would violate the, uh, it would violate cosmic censorship or quantum focusing, because again we said before, in a, one side of black hole you can't have uh, in a black hole form from collapse you can't have a classical extremal surface, again because of focusing. Same is more is true for a quantum extremal surfaces surface because of focusing. And in the case of the black hole um, evaporating into a reservoir, it's possible for this to happen. But the reason is that uh, you're talking about the quantum, the quantum extremality changes from time slice to time slice. So this is, you, you're able to get around that when you don't have reflecting boundary conditions. But here we have reflecting boundary conditions not coupled to a reservoir. So it seems that they're not, it's not possible for there to be a quantum extremal surface in the space time. So it seems that our strong Python's launch proposal should obviously be wrong. And what we actually are able to show, uh, and unfortunately I can't give you the detail now, is that uh, there, there exists a highly non-classical quantum extremal surface, sort of analogous to this, this one, one where the gradient of the entropy contributes the same as the uh, gradient of the area, which exists in the maximally mixed state in the code subspace that we need to reconstruct the space time. And you can argue from tensor networks that, um, not, not from gravity, but at least heavily motivated from tensor networks, that they comp that this, this non-trivial quantum extremal surface in a maximally mixed state, which has a blue shifted back reaction that results in a white hole singularity, um, that this actually, this quantum extremal surface um, is actually the one that's important for reconstruction of any state in this code subspace. So this is, I guess, more of a preview of Jeff's talk. Uh, and it, but it does turn out that this actually is robust against quantum corrections, although not in sort of a nice, an, an obvious way. So let me just give a summary and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So we want to understand the omission in uh, Hawking's calculation in the language of Hawking's calculation, ideally. Um, 
in the link in, just be, to be able to say here's the ingredient that that was missing here's where quote unquote he went wrong now one way of doing about this is to understand how omission of complex of complex data of high complexity and the omission of relevant saddles in the gravitational path integral agree which is where the python's lunch comes in so propose that everything behind the non-minimal quantum extremal surface is highly complex but as I mentioned before, what we really need is a converse of this as well. And so this zigzag procedure that I advertised shows that everything outside of a non-minimal classical extremal surface is in some sense highly complex. Or really what we should, what the zigzag procedure shows is that it's simple to reconstruct everything outside of a non-minimal classical extremal surface. And we will, haven't justified this, but we will give uh, what I would consider conclusive evidence, although, uh, this is in the quantum regime, we have to make various assumptions and simplifications. It's not as rigorous as in the classical case, but it is evidence that this remains true under the inclusion of quantum corrections. Uh, this is an, an up, upcoming work. So I think I will, I will stop there. I'm already, I think, seven minutes over. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very stimulating talk.